At the end of July, we raised our key interest rates for the ninth time in a row, to the highest they've been in over a decade. We started doing so one year ago to bring down high inflation. Today we want to talk about exactly how our interest rates are working to bring inflation back down. Raising interest rates is the best contribution we can make to reducing the burden inflation is having on the economy, on companies and on people. Welcome to the ECB Podcast Summer School, helping you understand what's going on in the economy and central banking. My name is Katie Ranger. I'm joined again by ECB Chief Economist and Professor Philip R. Lane, who will be explaining this to us today. Hi again, Philip. Uh, It's a pleasure uh, to also talk about the interest rates with you. Now, this high inflation that we've been seeing has been primarily linked to supply bottlenecks, Russia's war in Ukraine and the related energy shock. Some say central banks cannot even influence the factors pushing up prices right now. So how are our interest rate hikes helping to fight inflation in this environment, Philip? I think the the most direct way to think about it is, in the end, uh, who sets prices? Uh, and uh, firms set prices. When, when they try to work out, what is the price I can charge in a given uh, month, in a given year? Uh, they will look at all of the cost factors you, you mentioned, but they will also look at, at the level of, of uh, demand. Uh, so for s- some firms, uh, that demand is coming from, from households. So in the supermarket, in the restaurant, in the tourist hotel, it's, it's the uh, person on, on the street, the family. And for other firms, uh, it's business to business. They're, they're looking at the customer, it's some other business who's demanding their product. But whether it, it's a firm uh, or, or, or a household who, who's the, the, the customer, their level of demand will be influenced by, by interest rates. So, so let me zoom in on, on households. Uh, what kind of uh, 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 activities uh, are funded by interest rates? Uh, most obviously, it's going to be houses mm. because uh, people typically have a mortgage if they want to buy a house. So high interest rates have a pretty visible effect on the housing market. And of course, if the housing market cools down, there's lots of connected activities because if people don't buy a new house, they're not going to buy a new fridge, a new TV, new home furnishings. So so one basic mechanism is through houses. Uh, A second mechanism, uh, probably next in in the lineup for uh, typical people, is uh, cars. Many people uh, finance a car either by a lease or a car loan. And again, a higher interest rate will uh, reduce uh, their, their willingness to buy these products. On the other side of it, uh, many, many people are savers. Uh, and if, we, if there are higher interest rates, people would essentially think, think twice about consuming. They might say, and across everything, uh, across every service they consume, uh, every good they might buy, saying, do I really want uh, to buy this uh, because I could just leave my money uh, on deposit and receive a, a high interest rate? Mm. Uh, so, so that will also cool down demand. Now, I focus so far on, on households, but probably the, more, the single most important category is going to be the decisions of businesses. Businesses are much more likely to take out debt than, than households. So businesses who are want to fund uh, investment, or even uh, working capital in the sense of, in, in any given month, uh, businesses may need some short-term loans because while they're waiting for customers to, t- to pay their bills, for example, or, or they, they have to finance imported goods from the rest of the world, and before they sell them, there's going to be a gap when mm-hmm. they need some financing. So it's a pretty immediate uh, cost to business. So the cost of doing business goes up, and so those businesses will be looking to pull back. They will pull back from investing in, in new equipment, in, in new uh, factories, for example. Um, and again, just as we mentioned for, for households, if businesses are making money uh, and the interest rate is high enough to me say, well, why should I invest? Maybe I should put my money on deposit in, in the bank or put it in, in, in into the money markets more, more generally. So interest rates, if you like, are famously uh, a blunt tool. Uh, they're not very selective. 
uh, they operate across the whole economy, but clearly they have a much bigger effect if, if you're in the age group where you want to buy a house. Uh, if you're in the type of industry where you need a lot of debt to finance your activities. So it's blunt. Uh, it, do it doesn't matter equally uh, for everyone. Uh, but in overall terms, and this is what we're now seeing uh, one year into this uh, hiking episode, it is clearly it, it's having a, starting to have a visible effect on, on the level of, of, of demand in, in the economy. Now, you mentioned the way in which it immediately affects uh, businesses and I want to talk about that time element a little bit as we've as you've just said many people have been feeling the higher rates mostly through more expensive and and also harder to get loans as banks make it more difficult they tighten their credit conditions but higher rates also mean that savers are finally getting some return on their deposits again but at the same time monetary policy does take time to really affect the economy and prices. And it works with what we call a lag. Now, there are different things that affect this lag. For example, on the one hand, we, we have some countries here in the euro area where fixed rate mortgages are more the norm. And here, higher interest rates only kick in when the fixed interest rate term ends, which could make this lag longer. On the other hand, higher interest rates tend to focus minds on high debt levels. And that could speed up the effect of tighter monetary policy as people and businesses cut spending to pay off their loans instead. Let's talk about the lag, Philip. How long will it be? And, and, and when will the rate hikes really show their effects in the economy? Well, as I just said, we're about a year into this hiking cycle, uh, depending on uh, how you define it. And this is really visible now. But I, I'm pretty sure it's going to deepen in the next number of months. So we often think uh, that essentially maybe the peak I is around a year and a half. So as we go into the autumn, it's going to be more visible and it's going to continue to be working uh, in, in 2024 and in 2025. So it is a, a multi-year process. Uh, it, it helps explain why we have a medium term focus. We do not promise that inflation uh, drops very quickly. And let me come back to connecting it to, to uh, if you like, uh, the behavior of, of firms and of individuals. So uh, as you say, uh, some people uh, you know, in the initial phase might be insulated because they've got a, a fixed rate mortgage. By the way, most loans to, to firms are floating rate. In, in, in most countries. So firms will see it more quickly. Mm. Um, another basic factor I think we all recognize is, is many people do, are not kind of uh, looking at the markets uh, or their bank accounts for that matter day by day. They might have a kind of uh, annual plan uh, and they wait until, if you like, that they maybe at the start of every year they think, okay, uh, how should I revise my, my kind of uh, spending habits? Uh, for a firm, they, they may make decisions every quarter. Um, and um, you know, just as we've talked about before I in different episodes, that the world is full of uncertainty. Um, you know, decision makers in firms, uh, individual people, will also have to deal with that uncertainty. And uh, they may say, well, I'm going to wait and see where this settles down. Mm. Um, so w we do think it's, it's very natural. There are lags. And let me emphasize also something that you raised is compared to uh, 20 years ago. And it, it is uh, basically 20 years since we, we last had a kind of significant hike in interest rates. At that time, uh, overall debt levels were lower than they are now. So e even if, as you say, that in terms of mortgages, there are more fixed rate mortgages than there were. Uh, the overall level of that is higher. So in terms of the consequences of higher interest rates, uh, I think that matters. Because it's more widespread, essentially. Right. Or or, uh, or also those who are indebted tend to be more intensely indebted. Mm. But let me also mention something that I've been mentioning in, in different uh, contributions. It is in the, the modern economy, and let's think about the tech sector. I think one thing that's been visible it is in the modern economy, uh, famously uh, in various uh, t tech industries, uh, firms tend to be valued uh, not so much on the profits to make now, 
but the promise of high profits in the future. And the promise of high profits in the future uh, it has been able to attract funding today because uh, venture capitalists, other investors are prepared to wait mm. for those profits. But with high interest rates, that calculation changes. So with high interest rates, uh, it's expensive to wait f- you know, five or 10 years for future profits. And we are seeing uh, some degree of shakeout in the tech sector. So that's an- another way uh, interest rates work. They reduce the value of, of future profits. Um, and that, that, I think, is very important in, in a, the world we live in now, where uh, a lot of activity is innovation, uh, and where innovation often means uh, you know, d- delayed profitability far into the future. So w- we do have to think about uh, these factors quite a bit. Now, in addition to the discussion about lags uh, that we've just uh, talked about, experts are also debating how high our rates will go and, and for how long they'll stay there. But I want to look actually further into the future to when these shocks that we've been seeing have subsided. We've come from a long period of super low rates. We needed these to fight inflation that had been too low for a long time, unlike what we're seeing today. Philip, do you expect us to go back to an environment with super low rates after all these shocks have subsided? And is the era of cheap money, shall we say, over? So that, that's a, a great question. And uh, what I would say is essentially we have uh, basically one cycle following another cycle. So uh, until uh, uh, 2021, more or less, we were definitely in a long uh, multi-year cycle where inflation was well below our 2% target and we had launched essentially a campaign uh, of uh, negative interest rates and also a a lot of other uh, unusual policies. Now we're in a different phase of the cycle where inflation is is too high for too long, well above our target, and we've moved interest rates uh, quite a bit. So then uh, all of that uh, uh, does raise the question you've posed, which is when all of this settles down, where are we going to be? So let me give you uh, three answers. One, uh, the markets think uh, a number of years from now, more or less our policy rate will have come down to about 2%. So uh, today we're, uh, the ECB policy rate is, is at 3.75. Uh, so in a, you know, after this episode is over, the prediction is the interest rate will be about 2 the second answer is we also ask, ask various economic experts and more or less, the timing is a bit different, but more or less they give the same answer. They expect interest rates to be around two. So before the, the pandemic, uh, our policy rate was minus 0.5. So what that says is we're not going back to minus 0.5. We're going back to some number around 2% if, if these external uh, views are correct. That's much lower than it is today, but a lot higher compared to that kind of uh, extraordinary period. Let me come back to the connection with with inflation. If we end up with a situation where our policy rate is around 2%, inflation is at our target of around 2%. That means that, you know, if you net out the effect of inflation, uh, what's called the real rate of interest would be around zero. Mm. And famously, uh, a real rate of around zero is low. Mm. So, so what I would say is, is in terms of uh, the underlying uh, assessment of, of the of where the world economy is going, the calculation of the markets, the cal- calculation of the experts, including our own experts, uh, broadly speaking, at the ECB, it is essentially the world looks like it needs uh, a kind of a, a long run uh, inflation adjusted real rate of around zero, which is low. Uh, so not going back to super low. So let me say it low rather than super low uh, is where I think we, we're going to be. Now, as you know, Philip, we always ask our guests to share a tip, maybe a book, a film, a story uh, with our listeners about the topic we've been discussing today. What would you have linked to interest rates, shall we say? <laughs> so uh, I, I think uh, there is a perfect book. Uh, it came out uh, not too long ago and it's written by Edward Chancellor and it's called The Price of Time. Uh, 
So this is a, going back, if you like, to, to many centuries. And in terms of the an overall explanation of, of uh, why, why we should think about the interest rate as the price of time, uh, I think it, it captures a lot. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily endorse all, all of his views, <laughs> but in terms of having the grand sweep uh, of this kind of age old topic uh, of, the, of the interest rate, which, as you know, in, in many cultures uh, has been uh, hotly debated, mm. uh, is, I, I think, a great in- introduction. Okay, The Price of Time by Edward Chancellor Super. Thank you so much, Philip. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank ECB Chief Economist Philip R. Lane for explaining how our monetary policy is working its way through the economy. Listeners, be sure to check out the show notes for more on this topic. You've been listening to the ECB Podcast Summer School with Katie Ranger. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time. Thanks for listening.